Well, Coach Gilmore, it is an honor to have you on Lynch of the Leader. This is something I have been looking forward to for a couple of years. Thanks so much for carving out time for me. Mike, you, you have no idea uh, how honored I am that you asked me. And, uh, you know, just uh, your your friendship uh, the last few years, uh, you know, and, and all that you do with our coaches and scouts devotional uh you know, every time I every time I miss one on Monday, uh, my wife and I we sit and watch it together later in the week, and uh, it's so cool to listen to her say, "I get more out of this than anything else I do." You know, and it's <laughs> you know a bunch of men talking. She goes, "It's incredible how you all share and talk." And I mean, I, I just told her, I said, "Yeah, I said, you know, I said I, I miss a lot of Mondays because we have meetings and things, but I said I never miss watching." You know, mm -hmm. and so. You know, I, I deeply appreciate what you and uh, KB and every every all these guys have done to to make the, that that an opportunity for me to grow as a person of faith as well. Well, I appreciate that, attendant. It, it is a blast, and getting to see all the every every Monday when the screen begins to populate with all these faces from literally all over the country. Oh yeah, but everybody on there for the same reason. Oh. We're trying to do this the right way, and you, your life and baseball are very connected. When you were growing up, is baseball where you saw yourself going in life? <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of uh, probably like yourself in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm just assuming, but you know, uh, my my father was uh, played a short time in the minor leagues before he had to go to the Korean War, and then when he came back, uh, I was born, and you know, back back in those days, man, unless you were a dude, dude, you 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 had to go to work. You, That's you right. Play baseball, and so uh, you know, all my life I was basically grown up uh kind of a yankees brat whatever so to speak and uh you know it's it, uh every day was a baseball day you know even though i played all the other sports it was it was the one my dad loved and and you know heck i, I loved it too you know i enjoyed playing it and uh you know he he it was the only sport he really coached me in mm -hmm. and uh you know the rest i learned from others and did things but uh now, his influence in my life uh, was incredible. I mean, he uh, had a lot of patience, you know. Uh, he and I are so different. I got I got some uh, fiery competitiveness, insaneness, I got, I think, from my mother. <laughs> my, my dad was way <laughs> more laid back. and I mean, he competed, but he was not outwardly like my mom was, you know. So it, it was cool that, you know, I, got, I, got, I think I got the best from both of them. What's something you picked up from your dad in baseball that even today you find yourself saying to a player, thinking about when you're in the dugout and he wasn't he wasn't making millions of dollars doing it and nobody paid him paid an instructor to teach him, but he learned it. What's something you picked up from your dad you still use in the game of baseball? Well, he he was he was always that glass half full guy, mm. you know and. Well, which is very contrary because my mother seemed to be kind of a glass half empty person. <laughs> and so, you know, that, you know, that all that equal, you know, the opposites attract one another. So it was very interesting. You know, I think for me, you know, he was the guy that always helped center me, you mm -hmm. know, helped put things in perspective for me, you know, that, you know, that, that the world and life wasn't over. You know, if I didn't get a hit or I lost the game on the mound or whatever, and that, you know, it was more of what you got from it. You know, mm. he was always one that preached that you learn more from losing than you do from winning. And, you know, I feel like that's kind of like life. Yep. You know, all my bumps in the road, uh, you know, I, I learned more and made me a better man when I hit the bumps in the road than I did with the successes. And, you know, that that was one of the things that, you know, he always made me try to put in perspective, get over the the heartache of the loss of the failure. What did you learn from it? Do we have to work harder? Do you have to make an adjustment? Do you have what do you have to do to be successful the next time? You've spent thousands and thousands of hours at ball fields playing, watching, evaluating. If you had shown up as a college coach or a pro scout 
and you were evaluating Gary Gilmore growing up as a player, what did you bring to the game that made you who you were? How would how would somebody have described Gary Gilmore, the ball per, ball player, growing up and moving on into college and and post college? Um, I mean, as an athlete, I mean, I was I was a three sport three three sport uh, player. I was an all state player in, in football and baseball and was all district player in basketball. Um, you know, my, I, I think my, the traits I had physically were I was incredibly fast. I could really, really run. Uh, I had a fantastic throwing arm. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, the one thing that I had that, that I think I got that so many kids don't have anymore is by being a three sport athlete, my instincts for mm. playing game. I, I was incredibly instinctual on the baseball field because I learned so much from playing. You know, I was a quarterback in football, but also I played safety. I, I was a two-way guy. I returned kicks, punch, you, you name it. You know, I, in football, I was doing it. Baseball, you know, I, I, I stole a lot of bases, and, and I was a left-handed pitcher. And, you know, uh, and those things, and, the, you know, I, I learned – you know, from basketball too, you know, just that competitiveness and agility. But, you know, I think those are the traits that, you know, that the competitiveness, I, you know, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, you know, probably be the first one to tell you, anybody ever played against you probably tell you I was not the greatest. Uh, I did not show a ton of Christian traits out there competing, man. I, I was going to get out of your rear end. So. <laughs> we might pray together at some point, but what book would be explaining the white lines? I can promise that. Is that is fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. Do you think, and I'd love to push in on that a little bit, do you think that's a lost art with kids now that specialize starting at nine years old and they only play the game of baseball? They don't play any, I was talking to a quarterback at, at the football field, so he's a two-way kid. He's a backup quarterback for us, but we'll play on Friday night. Then at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, he's in a travel ball tournament pitching, and he hadn't thrown all week. Yeah. Do, do uh, you think that kids specializing in one sport has hurt the instinct part of the game? I, I think it's hurt everything, mm. to be honest with you. Not just the instincts, Mike. You know, uh, we, we live, and you know this as, as well as anyone, you know, our, our country, especially here in the last few years, you know, we, we've become a completely me society. You know, what have you done for me today? You know, I, I you know, everything politically is about me, me, me. You know, so many of these kids now that play just one, let's say they play just baseball. They miss out on the teamwork and the camaraderie of football. Football is a, you know, you, you can like football or not like football. You, you can not want your kid to get hurt playing it and the whole nine yards, but football teaches you a lot of things about yourself. Yep. You know, I mean, heck, I was a scrawny 155 pound kid out there trying to tackle 220 pound running backs that got ahead. I had a steam up and I had to decide whether I was going to be man enough to stand in their way yep. or I was going to get out of the way. And so many of the kids nowadays that 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 little bit of toughness that you know that that moment in time where they have to decide to be a man. Mm. Football, football teaches that as well as as much as you teach team in baseball. You know that that teammate in football, man. I'm a quarterback. That that guy blocking for me. You know I, I've got to trust him that he's yep. going to do his job, or you know I'm going to get my head taken off out out, out there trying to drop back and pass, you know, same thing in basketball. I think basketball, I, I, I played for an incredible coach. He had been a division one coach. And uh, I mean, our conditioning, I, I, best condition I've ever been in my life was playing for that man. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it, there were times when, I mean, honestly, we would be crying. It, it would hurt. It hurt so bad. And uh, you know, but it taught me, I, I, I realized I could push myself further than ever thought I could push myself physically. And it really helped me mentally to realize that there was more in the tank. You know, when I wanted to quit, there was more there. And I, that was one of the things that, you know, I learned from Coach Ayers that, you know, that, that has helped me as a baseball coach. You know, we, we, we run here, you know. We don't run as much as we used to, but we still run a good bit. And 
a lot, you know, the guys, they, they get bent out of shape. They look at it as punishment for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want to know who physically can do it, but also I want to know who mentally can overcome the physical hurt and continue to push on because at the end of the game, somewhere there's going to be times when you have to practice longer, do things. You can be out there for, you know, for 12, 13 hours in the double header. You know, are you going to, you know, who, which team's going to succumb to the fact that they've been out there the entire day on and off the field playing, playing all those innings and becomes more mental than it does physical. That's right. And, you know, and I, I honestly think, you know, I always go back to guys. I'm a big, I'm a big military. Uh, I was never in the military. My father was, but I'm a huge reader of military people and strategies and, and all the things that go into being Marines and special services, special ops guys, and just their physical training and what that does to the mind. You know, it's, it's kind of a, in my mind, a physical way of, getting to a place that fasting gets you, you know, where the mind is, is in control, you know, of the body completely yep. and totally. And, uh, you know, it, it's just very interesting. I, I, I do think we've gotten away from all of that, you know, and not being the guys, not playing three sports, all of those things come into play. You, you get something distinctive from each sport that you play, not just the skill part, but it's the teammate part. That's it's, right. You know, it, it really is. And, and kids, I, I, I say it to our kids to their faces. I mean, they, they're, they're as nice of kids as I've ever coached. And they want to do things. They want to learn. They're not bad kids by any stretch. They just they're, – they're, there's just no toughness to them when it comes to individual toughness, to be very honest with you. They, they, they've never been pushed. Mm -hmm. You know, they've never been allowed to fail, Mike. You know, I think that's probably the number one thing that you play enough different sports. You're not going to always, you know, unless you're Michael Jordan, you're not the star in everything right. you do, you know. So you have to learn to be a subservient teammate. You know, you might be the star in this one, but you're, you know, you're just an, an average Joe in the next one. And how you learn to deal with that and strive to be better and to be a great teammate. We, we've lost in this country and especially in sports how to be great teammates. Mm. We, we work at that. We work at it all the time, but it's very difficult. If you could sit a parent down whose kids are nine and 10 years old and you were to give them some advice from your playing days, which were incredibly successful, your coaching days, which have been legendary. What advice would you give a parent of a nine or 10 year old about if you want to raise up your kids and they're going to excel, what, what would you tell them and what would you advise them? That was that one for me is an easy question. In that, the number one thing I face every day here, and that I see everywhere, our parents now—they're wonderful parents. They're they're the helicopter parents and everything else, every other uh, connotation you want to want to put over them, hovering over their kids. The problem with parenting today is we don't want to allow our children to fail. Yep. How do you grow if you don't fail? These kids come to me. They have never failed, never mm. been allowed to fail. They, they get to school, college. They don't know how to deal with competing against another player. They don't know how to deal with the failure. Well, you know, <laughs> this guy's pretty good, and I'm not quite as good, and I'm failing, and this is happening. How, how do I deal with it? They have zero uh, ability to function in a failing situation and anything to lean on because every time they fail – this generation's parent jumps right in mm. to save them. You know, they change schools, they change travel teams. They, they do everything to not allow them to fail. It's the worst thing you can ever do because when they get out in the real world, I mean, shoot, Mike, look around. Heck, right. it, it takes most of our college graduates three, four, five years to land on their feet because they get out of college they don't know how to deal in the real world. You, you fail in the real world. That's right. You know, and, and, and they have no skills, at least at least for our guys. You know, I feel like, you know, we, we do a lot to try to help and address that. But uh, honestly, I mean, <laughs> it, just think about, back about when you played. Can you imagine if someone would have told you to go uh, see, you know, like Mike Lynch? Yeah. 
you didn't pitch very good yesterday, man. I see your heads down. Go see the, uh, uh, you know, go, go see the shrink over here. The, the sports psychologist we got on campus, you need to go see this guy. You know, I mean, we, we had laughed you out of the locker room, yep. you know, back in the day, you know, now it's commonplace. I, I, I mean, I, I would be willing to bet before the year's end, virtually 50% of my kids will go to see this guy at least one time, mm. if not multiple times, because they don't know how to deal with it. Right. You know, they don't, they, they need someone to talk to mom and dad are the, you know, a lot of times are the last ones you're, you're a dad. You understand how that goes. You know, by the time it gets to you, it, yep. it's a real problem, you yep. know? And, and so, you know, it, it's just parent, parents are missing the boat. You know, I tell my children, I said, I probably didn't do as good a job with that as I should have that you all need to allow them to fail. It's yep. not bad that they cry because it didn't work out. You know, something needs to motivate them to do some things on their own to overcome the failures that they have, because all of us, like I said, all of us aren't Michael Jordan. Sure. You know, all, all of us aren't Babe Ruth, you know, it just, it just is what it is. And, and somehow you have to figure out how to, how to balance that. And the reality is it re- realities are we're shaped by those failures and those failures are what set us up for what we're going to do. There was a day that your playing days came to an end. All of our oh, yeah. playing days come to end. Some are at nine, some are at 29 or 39 or 49, but everybody's days come to an end. When your days finished as a player, I know you got in scouting for a little while, then got in coaching. What made you choose the coaching route as where you saw your career path going? Unpack that a little bit for me. Um, and That was another fairly easy one for me in that. I always knew um, my, my dad had coached when he got out. I, he, he was a salesman his whole life, but, you know, he coached every single year. He coached in the spring and the summer. He coached some form of baseball. And, I, you know, I always knew that whenever my life as a player ended, that I wanted to, you know, I always, always thought growing up I would be a PE teacher and a high school coach. That, that's what I thought I would end up being. Then I got to college and realized, man, I, that this is a way bigger, better gig than, than a high school coach. You know, I can actually go find my own players and things. And, you know, the scouting thing was really good for me because uh, actually a guy I work for you, I'm pretty sure you pr- probably know or met Roy Clark. Oh, gosh, yeah. Who, who, uh, yeah. Roy and I grew up together. So, you know, I was one of Roy's Roy's uh, bird dogs for, for three years. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it just it that part helped me shape myself as an evaluator. Mm. And the one thing I learned very quickly was, you know, just because I like a guy or I find a guy as a scout, I can dream upon what I think I can do to help that kid and, and make that kid and kind of nurture and sculpt that kid into what I see in my eyes he can be. As a scout, you can't do any of those things. Mm. You turn them over to somebody else, and it right. becomes their vision of what this guy's going to be. And I'm going, no, nah, that ain't for me. You know that mm. I, I don't want to do all this work and turn it over. I, I want a chance to, I want a chance to mold that kid. And I, you know, and heck, I mean, I, I, I knew even back then. I mean, uh, that I was a relationship guy. You know, heck, I, I wanted to, I wanted to be a part of that. You know, I, I was so team oriented. I, I wanted to be a part of the team. So you go to UC Aiken, D2, and you had a great run at that level. What did you learn there at USC Aiken that shaped who you are as a coach today? So there, maybe not everybody knew your name. Maybe not every guy out there knew who Gilly was. What did you learn there, and what were some of the shaping things that made you into who you are today? (laughs) I, I tell you what, man, I owe that school and Coach Warwick and uh, everyone there, I owe them a lot because uh, there, there were times when uh, I got really frustrated and the whole nine yards. So, you know, I, kind of some of these things we're talking about, you know, it that experience prepared me for my next experience. And when I, when I was at Aiken, the day I walked in there, yeah, a lot of ways got extremely fortunate. The athletic director that was there got the uh, 
job at Wichita State. He was cleaning his desk out the day I walked in. And Coach Wark, the baseball coach, was the assistant AD. So they just bumped him right up the, the hallway to the, to the big office. And he just looked at me and said, hey, man, he said, if, you'll, if you'll stay here four years, uh, I'd like to continue to coach for four years. But he goes, at the end of four years, I'll give you this job if you do a good job. And he said, you know, this thing's pretty much yours. He said, I, I still want to be there game days. And, you know, said, I'll, on the days I can be there at practice, I'll be. But this kind of is your – thing i'm like holy cow man I, I i wasn't expecting this you know wow so i had to immediately I, I i didn't realize it i had to learn very quickly not only was i uh doing a lot of head coach things i had to do all the assistant stuff I had to do all the recruiting i was the strength coach i was the academic coach i i, I had to take care of three fields you know i made a whopping one thousand dollars my first two years there and you'll, you'll appreciate this, Mike. I tell my guys and they laugh at me, you know, I said, you guys would not do this. I was going to graduate school while I was doing all this. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, basically what, what my day consisted of for that thousand dollars, they paid for my graduate school, but the actual thousand dollars I got was for, I had to, I had, to, I had a 36 inch, John Deere ride mower. I had to take care of the baseball field. I had to take care of the softball field. I had to take care of the track, which had a football field inside the track. And then it was just masses amounts of grass outside the track. I had to mow those things. Well, you know, in the South, man, you're mowing twice a week. So, I mean, I was up at seven in the morning. I was on that track. And then at 11, I had to stop, jump off the tractor run in, shower, run to the cafeteria from 11.30 to 1.30. I was a short order cook in, in the student cafeteria. Holy moly. Oh, yes. And then at 1.30, I jumped out of my uh, out of my little outfit I had to wear to uh, do all that, and I jumped right back out on the practice field. And then at, uh, at 5 o'clock, I jumped in the car, and I had to drive to Columbia. I had to pick graduate school four nights a week at 6 30 at night and then drive home you know and the caveat for me being able to uh uh or for me working in the cafeteria was i obviously got fed lunch and i got fed dinner but also got food that i took home to my wife who was a school teacher she made a whopping nine thousand dollars a year back in that day and so uh you know that that was our life for two years for two solid years, and then in the summer I went to the Valley League and coached. And actually, I got paid. I got paid five thousand dollars because we won the Valley League championship the year the first year I was up there. But with bonuses and everything, I made five thousand dollars. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, man. <laughs> it <was> unbelievable. <laughs> but I tell them guys that, and they go, "There's no way you did it." I said, "I said I'm telling you right now." I said, I, "You know." Good Lord, take my life right now if, I, if I'm telling any bit of that and exaggerating it all. It was that day. It was that every single day. Wow. So two two parts of that. Number one, would you be who you are today if you hadn't have done that? Do you think you no. would be the, the person no. you are today? You know, Mike, when I came to Coastal, I had no idea. We we were basically where Aiken was. Mm. You know, I mean – uh, heck, when I came to Coastal, we were we were in the dark ages compared to everybody else. I mean, believe this, I had to. Our field was in way. I had a way better gig at Aiken than I did at Coastal when I came. Coastal was in a bad place, and then the field was in terrible condition. The cage was non-existent. Uh, I, I mean, it it was it was a it was a mess, and uh, you know all of that stuff at Aiken actually really prepared me for a lot of the challenges that I had at Coastal. You know, everyone, so many people saw Coastal as a, you know, as a sleeping giant that it actually has become. But we we had no idea how to get there, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I think that's one of the the things that, that really helped me. You know, I, I, I in me, I, I always – 
no matter what, I always saw the dream. You know, mm-hmm. my dream mm-hmm. from day one was, I mean, somehow, some way we can get to Omaha. You know, I never, I never preached a national championship, you know, and, uh, you know, one, one thing about, about selling, I, I do, I've done a, I've done a thing and I think it may, I don't, I can't remember if it was the thing I did when you were in Tuscaloosa with me, whatever, but you know, about when you sell your dream, mm-hmm. you know, you, you really know that your, your dreams and your goals and life that others embrace them when they take your goals and your dreams and they make them better than you ever. That's tried. right. That's right. And, and for me, I never preached when a national championship one time in my lifetime, never once, not even when we were one game away, did we ever even really even discuss it? You know, I, Omaha was my dream and that group of kids I had, took it and make it made it bigger than me. And that all started with where I was at at Aiken and the things that I learned, you know, there, you know, you probably gone through this as well in life where sometimes when you're doing things and, and there's a growth and a learning process in your life, <laughs> there are moments when you hate it, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're like fighting it, <laughs> like, you, you know, I'm cussing that school and missing that from time to time. Like, man, why do I have to do this? You know, paying me squad. I'm not doing the whatever. I'm doing all this work. I'm doing two guys jobs. And needless did I not understand God, God was in the mix in the middle mm-hmm. of all of that. You know, he was preparing me to put me in another place where I knew I wanted to be. But also, I believe, you know, that, that, you know, obviously God has, he knows all these things. So I think he was preparing me for that opportunity on the grand stage to, you know, to, to bring glory to him, you know, and, and you know, I had to go through all these things, you know, That's I, had right. to prove, I had to prove I was worthy. So there's a guy listening, a lady listening right now there, maybe, maybe the guy is a, he's a GA or he's a, young assistant coach at a D3 or a small NAIA. He's got a dream of one day being the head coach at a major university or they're sitting in a cube at their office. They they watch the boss walk by and go, man, one day I'm going to get that corner office. What would you tell them to do now that will prepare them for what their dream is later? What What advice would you give them? To just be true to yourself, you know, just, just trust in God. You know, I, I, I mean, heck man, my, my, my faith, you know, heck I, I haven't, you know, I've shared this with a lot of people too. My, my third year here, my first two years here, I had never lost in my life as a coach, you know, and I basically took this program over. I had no chance to recruit the first year second year we tried to do a quick fix and bring some juco guys in and it it just it didn't work and you know i think we won 25 games one year and 24 the next which you know the two years previous had been 17 i mean we had moved forward but compared to where the program had been at times we 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 weren't anywhere close and i i I mean i thought about quitting Mm. wholeheartedly you know and I'll never forget there was a PE job open at North Myrtle beach high school. Well, I actually applied for this thing and they called me and gave me the job. I never forget. I'm driving to North Myrtle beach high school and I pass our church and it was like, God grabbed the steering wheel and yanked that thing hard to the right. I just showed up at church in the middle of the day, no phone call, no nothing. And I walked in and I asked the secretary, I said, you know, is, is, is Ron, my, my pastor is Ronnie Bird. And I said, is, is Ronnie in? And she said, yep, he happens to be in the office. Thank God. Because three hours later, I called that school, told him I was staying where I was at. Wow. It was unbelievable our conversation and you know he he just made me realize that the signs 
I was looking at that were causing me so much anguish were not necessarily coming from God. They were selfish things and that I had to pray more. I had to wait that God had a plan. If he didn't want me there, then I wouldn't have to quit. They would, someone else would take care of that for me and God would lead me somewhere else. He said, but he hasn't done that yet. You need to trust him. Mm. You need to trust him. He's testing you right now. Are you going to, are you going to hang in there with him? And when we got done, I hung in there and the next year we turned a corner and win the league. Wow. And we're off to the races from that moment on. And I mean, to this day, I owe Ronnie so much, you know, and I, I would tell anyone that's aspiring, you know, that, you, you need to you, you need to just trust yourself. You, you need you need to be true to yourself. You know, don't. And, and I think too, and I was guilty of this, Mike. I wanted to be paid. I, I wanted things in life, you know, and especially coaching. And I, I would say probably in your job, ministering to people, all of us like to be paid and felt like feel like we're being paid what we're worth so to speak yep. the one piece that i didn't value the way i do now is it's not in monetary form that i get mm. payment mm. it is in relational value the relationships i have the people i know the lives i've touched the opportunities to pass on things to other players, to coaches from, you know, for, for me to share my faith with other people. I didn't, there's not a monetary value there. There's an intrinsic value. I tended when I was younger in my career to not value that as much as the monetary piece. Mm. And I would tell people, if you can find a way to not allow money to drive all of your, aspirations you know sometimes the job that you think you want because it pays more and has more esteem or more power when you get in the middle of it you wish you didn't have it that's right you wish you had your old life back you know appreciate a lot of the things that you have you know because i mean i'll be honest i thought my whole once i got to coastal as much as i love this place there was a part of me that thought, hey, man, I, you know, I preached, I want to take this team, this team, this team to Omaha. But, man, you know, heck, after, you know, after about 16, 17 years, when, when an Auburn and a Tennessee offers you a whole lot of money, it's real hard to go, okay, I'm going to walk away from this because I want to stay true to what I set out to be, you know, and, and you know, it took my faith growing a lot mm. to trust that, to be very honest with you. I mean, people here at my school stepped up, but also it was just me. I just knew it wasn't, wasn't, it just wasn't right for me, you mm. know, and for, for people aspiring, I think it's great that you aspire to, you know, I, I do believe that God allows us to grow in positional things here on earth. And the higher you go and the higher you achieve, the more glory you bring. But as long as you share that glory with him, then that's what it's intended to be. When it's a selfish glory, then I think it's a hollow victory mm. personally. You know, I, I, I mean, I really do. I mean, there, there are guys out there making four or five times what I'm making. But, hey, man, I, I, I wouldn't trade where I'm at for all the money in the world. I'm in, I'm in a place that I feel for sure this is where he wants me to be. And it's an opportunity to shape and mold lives, you know, in, in, in an environment that I can do that. I really think some other places that I could be wouldn't allow me to be the person that I am here. My school, I'm very, very blessed and fortunate. You know, I mean, you know, I, a lot of public places, public jobs, public situations, you can't speak about God openly. And without fear of someone yep. 
videotaping you and, and someone having a problem with it. But, you know, I'm very blessed here. I'm able to do that without any repercussions whatsoever. And actually I'm very supported by it. You know, you, you, you stick in there and I did not know the North Brittle beach story. You, you stick in there in 2016 comes you win the national coach of the year. Your team wins the coveted college world series, which is a gauntlet to how to try to get there is a gauntlet. So many breaks have got to go. you got to be good. Breaks have got to go your way. The ball's got to bounce right. The umpire calls got to go right. When you stood there at the end of that game and you hug the necks and you're high-fiving and you're getting the, the championship, what was going through your mind when you stood in the middle of that diamond in Omaha and went, we're the only team in America, Division One, that didn't end the season with a loss when it mattered. What did that feel like? <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> I told you I cried a few of these things when you asked me these questions, man. Um, when we first won, I don't know if you've ever watched or whatever, but probably the most iconic moment and that whole thing with me was, you know, after after hugging my my pitching coach and you know just my faith throughout that whole thing. People people have no idea, Mike. Uh, I don't think God picks and chooses who wins baseball games. That's right. You know, I, I, I don't think. But also, I do think the things that I ask him along the way, if you ever watch our games, ever, I've got all of them on video. You go back and watch. Watch me. You ever see me and, and watch any of those games? Watch, watch, watch me at third base in Omaha and LSU and all those places during that run. You'll see me with my hands like this at third base down by my side. I'm not praying ever to win. I'm just praying. I'm saying, God, whatever your will is, mm. you know, you're taking me down this road. Just don't let me, don't let me make a decision that takes an opportunity away from these young men that have worked so hard to get here. And I prayed that and prayed that and prayed that and prayed that over and over and i promised god i said I, whatever i said no matter what happens win lose or draw i can never love a group of people or coaches more than i love this group of guys mm -hmm. if we lose we lose whatever but at the end of it when we're done win lose or draw the glory is going to go to you mm -hmm. well if you if you look the one thing that I mean, I'm no more than doing this and, and one hug. And, you know, obviously, heck, they catch everything on camera. But, you know, I I immediately pointed for almost a solid minute with my mm. hand in the air, mm. pointing to God and to my dad. Mm. Because, you know, my, my, I wouldn't have done it without him. Mm. Just... My dad, my dad was, you know, my dad was not the most faith-driven person. My mom was way more so. But I learned so much about life from him. Mm. Yet, even though he was not the Bible pusher, so to speak, in our family, he lived his life in an incredibly Christian way. You know, he honored Sundays. We went to church. We did Christian things. We, I was raised in a Christian home. I mean, you know, uh, you know, he, I mean, he, he, you know, he never once in my life did I ever see my father lay a hand on my mother. You know, I mean, just, I lived in a loving home and, and, in a place and, and, you know, I can't ever thank him enough for that. And, you know, my faith grew exponentially. I, I there's a book I read. A friend of mine here at Coastal gave it to me. 
in the summer of 2015. For years and years, my wife, there were times when I got so frustrated that, you know, going, man, I, I got to find something else to do here. Well, I, I can't get over the hump. We're, we're, we're good, but I, I, I want more. I, I you know, I, I just, you know, I was got frustrated at some of the things at school, the, you know, they'd promised the stadium for years. And uh, there were a lot of things that went on over the years. A very dear friend of mine kind of led me through a spiritual path at Coastal, a guy named Mark Roach. Mark Roach laid a, a book on my, uh, on my desk in the summer of 15 called Lead for God's Sake. I read that book. I'll never forget. I read it in, in, you know, we, we had gone to the regional at Texas A&M and we'd had two or three kids get hurt. And we ended up getting a championship game, but, but couldn't get it done. And, uh, you know, I was really frustrated. He laid that book on my desk you know, when we got back. And I let it sit there for probably a month. And by the middle of July, I decided to read it. Well, I read it. Thought, man, it's a pretty cool book, whatever. And, uh, let it go. Just kept staying on my mind, Mike. I couldn't couldn't let that book go. So about middle of August, right before the kids came back, I read that book again. Mm. And this time, this time I let it sink in. I'll never forget my wife. She's a, a huge Bible reader at night, and so she's sitting in the bed reading the Bible, and and I've got this book, and she almost always outreads me at night. I'm always, I'm, I'm reading and falling asleep. <laughs> She's reading and reading. So, but uh, I never forget. She looked over at me and my whole entire shirt was completely soaking wet. And I had been reading that book and the whole time I'm reading it, I'm realizing this guy in this book is me. Mm -hmm. and i'm going how how have i missed this walk in life i've been so focused on the wins and the achievements that the greatest impact i have is not on the wins but it's in the lives i have ability to touch and influence and the relationships for a lifetime that I have an opportunity to create with every kid that comes through there. It's not like I hadn't done those things. I just hadn't valued them. Mm, mm, that's a good way to not say enough. it. Yeah. I, I, it's, it was secondary. If it, you know, it's hard to admit it was secondary to winning, you know, it, it was, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, Hey man, we have great relationship, but we, you know, we're, we're 25 and 35 that, that, you know, it just wasn't me. And yeah. I'll never forget. I walked into the locker room, our first meeting there in the fall of 15 with that championship team. And we do all of our, all of our pre-fall stuff, whatever. And then, I just talked for about 15, 20 minutes. And at the end of it, I just told him, I said, one thing I'm going to change, we've never done. I said, for a lot of you that have been here four or five years, I said, this is going to freak you guys out. I said, I said I'm going to walk up to you every day. And I'm going to tell you I love you because I really mean it. And I really care for you. And I said, when I see you in campus and we walk past each other, I'm going to tell you, I love you. And I said, I'm going to tell you at practice, I love you. And I said, if you ever get to a point where you feel that about me, feel free to tell me back. Feel free to tell any of your teammates, if you really love them, tell them you love them. The most incredible thing happened. It took probably about two weeks of me just doing that. And then it started to gradually come back at me hey coach love you guys would pass me in the hallway at the field i'd see them somewhere 
you know, and it became infectious. They began to te tell each other. And the camaraderie and brotherhood that came from all of that was incredible. I can promise you, heck, Mike, we just had uh, this past weekend, they uh, um, inducted our entire 2016 team into our Coastal Hall of Fame. Every single guy to a man, the first thing they said to me when they saw me, one four, I love you. Gilly, I love you. Very important. They didn't say hi, nothing, yep. whatever. That was the first thing that came out of their mouth. And seeing them say it to each other still to this day is so incredible. Because I ask them all the time, I said, how do you feel about that? And they got like, you know, it was really a little bit weird in the beginning. And now people look at us like we're a little bit weird when we're out somewhere and we're 30 years old and, you know, Yep. We tell each other we love each other, but they go, Coach, till we quit breathing, that will be how we talk to each other yep. because we really mean it. And, you know, they go, the, the brotherhood we have here amongst ourselves as a team is incredible. I mean, it was on, we only had three guys off the whole entire team. And, uh, you know, two of them, uh, two of them, uh, one's in the military, one of them's a football coach, a college football coach. And, the other one uh, had a had, had his brother was getting married, so he had he couldn't be there. But everybody else came back, and I mean it was it was like a love fest to be honest. I mean it was so cool to see, and guys asked me, you know, we went through we went through uh, between Omaha and the others, we went through uh, seven elimination games. Wow, and, and I, we're we're. Hey, five of the seven, we were one strike away from being eliminated. Five times, one strike away, and we overcame it. And Mike, when when you when you look at these guys, I mean, I had guys, I had, I've had a ton of people ask me, Coach, what in the world do you do to motivate you guys? I, honestly, the only thing I ever did, and I never did it until we got to Omaha, <laughs> is the 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 meeting room that they gave us. We just took all the chairs and put them in a circle. And I just told them that once, once we got beat that first time and we had to go through uh, five elimination games during that thing, or six, excuse me. And, uh, you know, I would just tell them, say, hey, we're going to spend 10 minutes before we walk out of the door and get on the bus. Each time I would tell them, say, look at the guy across from you. Look at the guy on your left. Look on the right. Eyeball him. Lock eyes with him. Realize and understand when we walk out of here, if we lose, within 24 hours, the chances of us ever as a group being together again will be over. Yep. We get back, we're scattering, we're gone. Within a day, everyone's gone. Only way we extend our brotherhood at this moment in time to stay together is to win. Mm. Well, I'm telling you right now, every single day, Mike, I'd stand at that door. Every guy would go by me. Every one of them would fist pump me. Coach, we'll see you tomorrow. Ooh. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, it was unbelievable. And, and you look at the, you look at what we did. I watched them the other day because I had to put a video together of our highlights to show during the Hall of Fame dinner and stuff. We, we did some stupid stuff out there. Things that, I mean, you, most of the time you get beat by, but every single time we messed up, any significance, huge base running blunder or this or that, some guy came right behind it. Because That's as soon so as good. a guy messed up, we had they got to the dugout, the next guy would go, I got you, brother. I got you. I'm going to pick you up. I got uh, you. Oh, it was unbelievable. And, and, little, they and little did you know, Coach, that all of that was going to prepare you for a season of your life you didn't see coming in Absolutely. the area of your health. And yes. you get a diagnosis of cancer, which you have battled in incredible ways. What did you find out about yourself? What did you find out about your faith when you got that cancer diagnosis and found out how tough this is actually going to be? What did you find out? 
I'll never forget the, uh, I had a, it was on a Sunday, uh, late January of 2018. I had this massive pain in my left hand side of my back. And, you know, back, you know, back in the good old days, uh, you know, of, 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 of Google and all that mess, you just get on the internet and start, start dialing up. Okay. Yep. What could this be? So, you know, I self-diagnosed myself with uh, a kidney stone. And so my wife goes, let's go to the hospital. I said, no, nah, man, I am not going to the hospital. That's, you know, that was right when COVID was starting. I said, no, nah, I am not doing that. And I said, I'm going to somehow tough it out. So I'll never forget. I, I didn't sleep a wink Sunday night. I thought I was going to die a couple of times. It hurt so bad. And the urologist I, that I went, that I go to, his two young sons go to my baseball camps. And I had his cell number. So I call him at 630 in the morning. <laughs> I said, Dr. Wood, I said, I, I said, man, I said, I'm dying. I said, I got this pain described or whatever. He said, uh, get in the car, come straight to my office. He goes, uh, I'll take an x-ray. We'll see. We'll see if we can figure out where it's at, how big, blah, blah, blah. Well, I go there and he's running everything all by himself. His, his assistant, had, his, his nurses hadn't got there or whatever. So I'm not sure he actually knew how to do all this stuff or not, whatever. But he takes an x-ray of, of my uh, uh, kidney and the x-ray is cloudy. Mm. It's not definitive. He can't see the kidney stone so he calls the hospital he sends me up to the hospital and i do a ct scan and i go back to his office about two hours later he comes walking in the office and i i mean i could tell by looking at his face holy you know what yeah something ain't, something ain't right and he looked at me he said coach he said that the kidney stones were right by your bladder. He said, you'll pass that thing. He said, I think probably the majority of your major pain is gone. He said, probably within a few hours, that thing will pass and you'll be okay. He said, but uh, coach, we found something else. He said, there's a, there's a huge tumor mm. right off of your pancreas. He said, uh, I've already called the oncologist up the street at the coastal cancer center. He said, she's waiting for you. He goes, you need to go there right now. Well, I thought my wife was, I thought she was done. I mean, she, you know, I mean that as soon as he told her that, I mean, seeing her go crazy, you know, I, I knew that I couldn't be that person. I couldn't mm. do that, you know, and being very honest, I just, I knelt down and just said a prayer. I just said, please, God, you know, whatever you have for me, just help me be strong, especially for her. Help me be positive. Don't let me have a pity party. You know, that, that, that you know, that if this is another challenge, you've challenged me my whole entire adult life. You've created mountains for me to overcome. You've led me down the paths. You've allowed me to fail. If this is another mountain, that by me climbing, it brings glory to you. So be it. Mm. Just bring bring it on. And I, I, I've ever since then, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that, that whole thing's been an incredible whirlwind for me because, I mean, you know, they misdiagnosed me originally. They told me I had liver cancer, which, you know, liver cancer is, you know, I mean, that's a very quick death sentence. You know, it's very few people live more than a year, a year to a year and a half, two years. Well, I used my used my connections of former players and got in MD Anderson and uh, you know they actually uh, when it was said and done took them about ten days to figure it out themselves and that's the best place in the, in the world to go for cancer and um, you know they they told me said uh, you have uh, what they call a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor you know and, and you know the the part about that that at least is is favorable as we do have drugs that can you know that can fight it and hold it in place and and you know give you give you some years and so you know through that you know my, my challenge is just just been to you know i just i i look at this i mean everything if you if you walked in my bathroom you can't even really see the mirror my wife has you know 
about 25 Bible verses plastered <laughs> up on the mirror, on the mirror man. which is my ugly mug. That's way better to look at than me. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of them is about, you know, climbing mountains. And, uh, you know, I look at it as this, you know, I, I, you know, I, I look at it as, as, okay, you know, God, that this is this, you know, you, you could have took my life, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. at, at any moment in time and obviously still can, but, you know, I, I do believe that you, you didn't give me this just to give it to me. You gave it to me to find out how much I want to battle. How many more lives you, you I want to touch? Uh, how much more can I do here to serve you here on this earth while I battle this deal? Mm. And, you know, I, I just looked at it as a challenge. You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't had one, one woe is me day at, at this point. You know, been a couple of times I wanted to start into it, but yep. I, you know, it, it's like, no, nope, that's not going to be on me. I'm not going to do that. I want to stay focused on my faith that this is God's challenge to me, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, it, it uh, you know, seeing, seeing all my players and all of our alumni, you know, wearing the, the wrist brace supporting me and all the people that come to the stadium, get one. I mean, just, it's been an incredible ride, you know, mm -hmm. the amount of lives. And I mean, just the amount of people that, have cancer, you know, that have reached out to me. Mike's been incredible. You know, they've read a story or heard something or whatever, or, you know, possibly hear this yep. podcast. They go, Hey man, I, I, I'm living that, you know, I, I want to reach out to that guy. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing how many people have found ways that, to get a hold of me that, you know, that, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to even this day and age to, you know, reach out to somebody that you don't know and just start a conversation of, Hey man, I, you know, I've got this kind of cancer, that kind of cancer, or, you know, how, how did, how, how did you deal with this? You know, and it, it's, uh, you know, heck, uh, you know, one of the guys that, uh, you know, that I brought into our group, uh, yeah. Scott Sanders passed away the other day, you know, and, you know, his wife called me the other day and we talked, um, you know, he's got a little son that's, in the eighth grade. So, you know, I, I wrote both of them a real long letter and sent, sent Will some coastal gear and, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that I, you know, that, that I mentor to him. And, Good. you know, I, I told her that, you know, I really very much want him to come and come to our baseball camps every year. And, and then, you know, he'll come as my guest that, you know, that, that Scott was a real in a brief time that, that, we were actually spent together in real true friendship. You know, I mean, he impacted my life very, very, very much so in a faith-based way. Final question of the day, Gilly. <laughs> Through this process that you wouldn't have chosen, but but it, it chose you, what have you learned about Jesus that you couldn't have learned any other way? What What's something you've discovered about him and your faith that if you had just read it in a book and you'd not experienced it, you wouldn't know. I think for me, I had to, I've had to turn my whole life over to him, not just a bit and a piece. I mean, everything in my life, I had to just say, Lord, you're in charge of all of this now. You know, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't have a template for exactly what your plan is, but you know, you, you've got to guide me. I, I've moved in that direction, but I've always held back something, you know, I've never, I've never completely got in both feet, rear end, the whole nine yards in the, in, into, into you where I just turned everything over mm. to you i don't I, I'm, I'm you know i i know that you're going to help me prepare my family for life after me you're preparing me for life beyond here yep. you know that that you're giving me an opportunity to prepare myself you know i i, I think of you know i mean you know i think of people who don't have that opportunity 
you yeah. know, uh, heck, you, you look at the, 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 the horribleness of what just happened at UVA, you yeah. know, and, you know, one of the things that one of the, the, that, that I think a lot of people don't realize is that you can't, you know, I think a lot of people think that you, by being a Christian, you have to give up so many things in life. And they don't want to come to Christ till the very end. Mm. And because they, they think they're going to miss out on something. Oh, you know, I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is, is the fact that we don't have control of one minute from now. You could have a heart attack. You could have a car accident. You could have anything. Where are you at in your place with the Lord at that moment in time? You know, for me, barring things I can't control, he gave me he gave me an opportunity to make some real decisions in my faith. How how, how I wanted to, you know, I, I think I've become way more outward with my faith. I share it way more. I was more private with it for a real long time. And now I'm very confident. I'm not as Bible knowledgeable by any stretch as you, KB, some of those other guys on our on our calls. But there's no way you could love the Lord more than I love him. There's a place in my heart that, you know, I'm so blessed to have had all the challenges, all the struggles because they made me a better man. Mm. And they led me to him. They led me to him. Each and every one of them moved me closer and closer to him. And it just, it, it shaped me into the man that I am today. You know, I, I, far from perfect, still have a long way to go, but I, I'm way closer to what I want to be, to be very honest with you. You know, I, 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 I don't quit striving. I surely not there by any means. And, like I said, it's, it's so incredible what each Monday means to me because I learned something. I see a different point of view. I see someone with somebody with a contrasting, contrasting point of view of how they interpret a, a, a mm. passage. And then I see here and see people that oh, you see it the way I did, you know, and, you know, it, it, it's it's just so eye opening. It helps me grow. Mm. And, you know, God, God's not God. I, I, I just believe, Mike, in my life that God's not done with me. You know, when, when he's done with me, obviously it'll be my time, you know, and I, I just hope it's many, many years. I, I, I have a lot of energy and I have, a, I have, you know, in, in my next life, I don't know what I'm going to do as far as outside of being a college baseball coach, but you know, my, my servitude to him will move forward even once I get out. You know, because I'm going to have to, I'm not going to have that ready made 45 guys that get to come in and listen to me every day. You know, I'm going I'm to have to seek them out. But, you know, the good part about it is there's baseball and there are people and there are especially young people everywhere in the world. It's not, they're not hard to find. Right. You just have to want to find them and you just have to want to, to love them and embrace them and, and share, share, share your faith with them. You know, you don't have, you just have to let them know. I think all of my guys know how I feel and how much I love love Jesus, and and you know, I, it, it, it's a cool thing. They, they I, I will tell you this and end on this. This is one of the coolest things that's that I've ever done. Is during during COVID, we would have we started having player and coach lunches because we couldn't ever have any meetings and we would do them in this open air area of our stadium. I'd have the lunches brought up there and each guy would basically be at their own table. You know, and I'd do, I'd do 10 or 12 this week, 10 or 12 the next week. Well, I would always ask them, you know, I mean, I would always pray. I'd pray over the food, but I'd also end up praying, saying another prayer over them and stuff. And I would ask them, I said, you know, guys, I said at the end of practice every day, you know, I, I do, I said, some of them are what I would consider devotionals. Others are life lessons yep. that are Christian based. I said, 
but there are things to help make your mind think about, you know, growing up, making, making decisions about life and different things. And I said, when it's Christian based, et cetera, I said, you know, how, how do you guys feel? Well, you know, probably a third of the team are faith-based guys. And, you yeah. know, man, coach, thank you. You have no idea how hard it is for us, mm. you know, because we're looked at as different yep. because we're faith-based, you know, the other two thirds were so incredible. This really blew my mind and made me realize how, how screwed up our world is, especially in our country. Now, the other two, two thirds to a man, Mike, not one guy has ever come up to me and gone, coach, I really, I really don't want to listen no. or whatever. All of them said, you know, coach, I've never been exposed to this very much in my life. Every time you read a verse and you explain it, or you talk about, you know, Christianity in, in context of, uh, of the message you're giving makes me think, mm. please, keep, please keep doing it. Coach. I want to learn more. I don't know if it's for me. I have to make up my own mind, but please keep doing this because I've never really been exposed to it, but I would like to learn more. Every single, it's the most incredible thing ever. You know, and I, I think about it, you look at our schools and the things that we do where we don't, where you and I grew up, I mean, we, we prayed in school. We, yep. we, we, you know, it was part of who we were. We've gotten away from that. Yet this group of kids are telling me, they're searching for something in their life that's missing and we're not giving it to them, you know? And so uh, that's why I feel like, you know, I, I feel like with my cancer, God, God's, it, it gives me an opportunity to, to, to really, you know, it gets people's attention. Mm. It's kind of an icebreaker, you know, it, it, it gives me an opportunity to get in, you know, with, with, with some, with, with some faith-based things that, that just baseball sometimes doesn't open the door for. And, you know, cause I can always go, hey, man, you know, God's just giving me another challenge. You know, he, he just threw another mountain right in front of me, just like the other ones I had to crawl over to, to, to achieve some things on the field and do some things, you know, he, the, these mountains, he keeps throwing at me, you know, they're challenges, you know, and, and, and this one, this one's the biggest one of all, you know, that, that it, it is. And, you know, I feel like so much of my success so far for three years that has been, you know, I honestly think it's been my faith and my sure. attitude, you know, it, it, it's, you know, again, you know, I, I see people that are beat down by it. You know, I, I refuse to let it do that to me. Well, coach, you are an inspiration. And I want to tell you this. I don't know you face to face know you because we don't get to see each other a lot, but I speak on the behalf of a lot of people. I love you, and you you are a blessing to many, my friend. Well, I love you too, and I I, I can never thank you enough for, you know, I, I know you 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 do it, but because it's a, a a part of you, and it's a part of your love for for uh, for Jesus. But thank you for what you do on Mondays and the lives that you touch. I mean, you 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 know. Like like myself, you you probably take it in some manners for granted, mm. but you you have no idea because I I know I mean all those guys I mean all those scouts and the coaches whatever I mean so many of those guys are very good friends of mine and for all of us I'm speaking for all of us what you guys do to put that on and continue mm. that going is, is just so inspirational to all of us too and I I love you back my friend and uh, I pray that the good Lord. Uh, you know, continues to move you in the directions he's moving you. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, my wife, when, when I told my wife that uh, you were a Liberty guy, she goes, oh, my God. She goes, you would actually listen to a Liberty guy? That's, <laughs> <my> guy. <laughs> I That's said, phenomenal. Yeah. I, said, I, said, I said, God works in mysterious ways, man. <laughs>